Pulling at everyone before. Good morning, everyone. Oh, thanks. Audience participation. Uh, nice to see you all here on day two of the conference. Hope you had a great day yesterday and you're off to a great start so far. Um, we're excited for our session today. Um, we're going to start off with a land acknowledgement and then we'll, we'll get into the, the presentation. So we'd like to start off by saying that the city of Halifax is situated in Mi'kmaq, the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, also, just like to know, kind of a, a accountability mechanism for myself, that land acknowledgements are uh, a reminder for us, uh, particularly those of us who are white settlers, of the history and current day practices of colonization, which are, uh, includes taking, the loss, uh, taking of or the loss of land for indigenous peoples, also known as the original eviction of indigenous peoples, and that these acts uh, by European colonizers continue to perpetuate indigenous homelessness to this very day. Um, and for myself and for others in this room, now that we are, we are learning and we are uh, uncovering truths, in, including many of the speakers at the conference um, about the uh, issues pertaining to Indigenous homelessness, now that we're knowing better, we really are compelled to do better. And so for myself anyway, the land acknowledgement is really a symbol and an outwards display uh, that you know, we all need to be committed to acts of reconciliation and decolonization. So um, with that sort of reflection, we'll, we'll get into the session and just making sure everyone's in the right room. The title of the session you're in right now is Lessons from Homelessness Responses in Rural Areas and Small and Medium-Sized uh, Cities. And the description follows that um, big cities receive a lot of attention when it comes to homelessness, but there are important innovations occurring in smaller communities as well. Uh, the first presenter, hello, um, <laughs> we have three presenters here, uh, will share their analysis of the progress of multi-year plans to end homelessness in three small Canadian cities, Kelowna, uh, BC, Lethbridge, Alberta, and Sherbrooke, Quebec. Uh, the second presentation we have over here uh, will uh, describe how medium-sized communities have adapted their responses to preventing and ending homelessness. The presenters, presenters will draw on their research project, Where Does Nanaimo Stand?, uh, which compared homelessness rates in 10 Canadian cities and found that medium-sized communities have unique strengths that enable them to intervene in homelessness in unique ways. And our third presentation um, will seek to address the ways that quantitative data often reduces people to numbers, uh, leaving out the humanizing component of individual stories. Based on countless re research studies carried out across Nova Scotia over the past eight years uh, with a focus on rural regions. And so our presenters uh, today, uh, we're taking shifts because there's a lot of folks, so there'll be a little bit of a dance between the presentations. Um, so we have uh, Katie Coleman uh, and Helen Laramie uh, from UBC Kelowna Homelessness Research Center. And then over here we have uh, Andrew Thornton uh, and John McCormick from Nanaimo Systems Planning Organization. And then over here, um, we have uh, in the middle there, Alicia Christie uh, from Homeless No More, Kim Kent from Peer Outreach Support Services and Education, AKA the Posse Project, love that, uh, and Peggy Vassallo uh, from Nova Scotia Public Health. So I'm gonna hand it over to the presenters, a reminder to use the mic for the virtual viewers and also for folks with, um, I think with audio or different hearing abilities uh, or they cannot hear you. So right. have fun and I'll do my little five minute wave. Wonderful, thank okay. you. Yeah, it's on okay. Hello everyone. So we're gonna present you the homelessness prevention plans in small Canadian cities, an analysis of problems, prospect, and small insight into comparative analysis across small Canadian cities. So we were a researcher from both Quebec, Alberta, uh, so, sorry, for Quebec, Alberta, and also British Columbia. Uh, our research focuses on homelessness in, in small, medium-sized cities, as it was said, an area often under research. One significant issue we've observed is that homelessness programming and policy changes are often implemented without the benefits of adequate prior research. So siloing and service sector are unlimited uh, knowledge transfer pose additional challenges. Finally, our research has shed light on the challenges of multi-sector cross-provincial homelessness innovation development. Understanding these challenges is crucial for developing effective strategies to address homelessness in diverse regions. 
First, we examine how individual agencies mobilize to shift their internal policies and the procedure toward a, toward a housing first and reaching home uh, approach. We delve into how agencies are included in consultation processes and how to address organizational changes resulting from plans. <clears throat> Next, we explored how agencies implement internal data collection methods for share measurement and evaluation of their new programs. Our research highlights the importance of data-driven approaches. Lastly, we investigate how agencies coordinate services to ensure that clients receive the right help for the right service, for, from the right agency. I'd like to highlight that our findings have eliminated areas of, for potential enhancements. For example, uh, we'll consider how agencies can be more effectively included in consultation processes and how they can adapt to organizational changes resulting from plan. So we conducted, uh, we conducted interviews with 40 key informants, including frontline workers, middle management, and executive director from various agencies. Um, these agencies encompass emer emergency shelters, housing first services, system planning agencies, soup kitchen, and street outreach organization, providing diverse support to homelessness service users, including youth and indigenous individuals. We employed qualitative methods, conducting one-on-one conducting -on -one interviews that lasted between 34 minutes to 108 minutes with an average duration of 62 minutes. These interviews followed a semi-structured, open-ended approach guided by a readiness to change instrument previously developed for social service providers experiencing organizational change and remain open-ended as per best practice. So upon cross-site analysis, we developed four main themes. Oh, I'm getting some feedback. Uh, so the first is jurisdictional issues and oversight complications. The second is unstable and inflexible resources. There's also issues with communication flow and data sharing across sites and service providers' attitudes towards organizational change. So we developed this figure to demonstrate how these themes reinforce each other. So often homelessness plans are initi initiated, which can result from jurisdictional issues, both in terms of our political system and its structure, as well as the consultation processes with agencies. This can lead to unstable and inflexible resources for mid-sized Canadian cities who are aiming to adapt to these homelessness plans. This also leads to communication flow and data sharing issues. And all of these themes reinforce one another and affect service providers' attitudes towards organizational change. So the first theme that we'll get into a little bit further is jurisdictional issues and oversight complications. So this takes place in a number of ways. The first being that participants described insuff insufficient consultation processes with government agencies when initiating and developing homelessness plans. So when consultation takes place, the data across sites suggests that it is limited to a very small number of service providers operating at the executive level. While often included in the development processes for homelessness planning, executives still highlighted that consultation felt ineffective ultimately. This is exemplified by one executive who said, I think sometimes consultation is not done that well. It's done more like, hey, we're a government department, we have this idea, we're going to implement this idea, we're going to tell you about it, and then after we're done telling you about it, we're going to say we consulted. So the feeling is that local agencies remain reactive policy recipients as opposed to proactive policy initiators in the homelessness planning process. The second way jurisdictional issues take place is through the very structure of our political system and bureaucratic red tape. It often makes it difficult to plan and affect long-term structural changes when we are operating on a four-year cycle of our political system. This was discussed by one executive who said, the fact that we have a political system that will run on for four years, and within those four years, there's only about two years within that window that you can put get anything done. 
That means the system is set up in such a way that putting out fires is really how this is done. The third way jurisdictional issues and oversight complications take place is through the policy scale and scalability of homelessness plans to small to mid-sized Canadian cities. Policy scale is often universalized and it is often urban focused, focusing on larger cities. And this means that smaller cities, the communities that we interviewed, have to adjust what, which can put unnecessary demands on already scarce resources. <clears throat> Sorry, so our research allies a pivotal challenge and another pivotal challenge in our pursuit to endless homelessness, which is unstable resources. Um, as exemplified here, the issues with resources have multiple impacts. So here I'm going to be quoting a supervisor uh, of a community organization who said, I know that our service provider feel undervaluated and underpaid, and I think that that's challenging when their work is so challenging. And especially in, again, recent times, where I feel like there's a significant staff shortage in not just this sector. And so when you can see that your friends at the bike shop are getting $20 an hour, and here you are working with, high, with complex high needs, folks that require a lot of mental energy and emotional capacity, and you're getting $23 an hour, you know how does that feel fair. Another uh, executive member said while speaking about their relationship with government, uh, he said, uh, they said, so I'm told, meet these criteria, offer their services, and at the same time, here is the money you have to do it 24 seven. I'm not able to do it. Well, I do it, but there is a high staff turnover. I'm not able to develop an expertise. I have a stable team, which is my management team, my specialists who are there, but my field staff, I have an incredible turnover. This means that they don't have time to build up their expertise to develop it. So I'm asked to meet to certain things, but I'm not giving the financial means to do so. For me here, it's not in terms of capacity, in terms of bed and space. It's the capacity of intervention that limits me. I don't have all the employee I would need. That's the problem we have. It put a constant stress on us with, all, with the, all the programs. It means that no, we don't have the resources. We're not even close to having it. So this quote really um, uh, capture, uncovers a concerning cycle in our battle against homelessness. So inadequate wages in for frontline workers lead to high turnover, robbing us of experience and passionate professional. This in turn diminishes our ability to engage in vital system planning. Meanwhile, funding and flexibility exacerbate the situation, pushing nonprofit and community organizations uh, to, conf to conform rather than advocate for innovative solution. This rigidity perpetuates inefficiencies and restrict effective resource allocation. So this vicious circle, insufficient wages, limit time for planning and funding constraint, leave them in a perpetual state of reaction rather than proaction. This cycle perpetuates inefficiencies and limit effective resource allocation, further exacerbating the challenge. Yet, this lack of time exacerbates another challenge they confront, the dearth of data sharing within communities. This deficiency in their organization's ability to comprehend and validate the impact of their initiatives. Frontline workers in particular feel that the absence of comprehensive community data often navigating in the dark as they endeavor to combat homelessness. Here I'm quoting uh, uh, frontline workers while they say, we don't really have community data. So right now I feel like we're just kind of shooting in the dark and trying to hit eliminating homelessness. Which leads us to our third key, um, uh, key finding. So the information shared among, among organizations predominantly concerned daily operations with little emphasis on broader application. When inquiring with frontline workers about their ability to provide feedback regarding policies and government orientation, the response was clear. There is no established channel of communication. Um, the policies and government orientation concerning homelessness appear to be crafted without the benefit of frontline workers' expertise. The exclusive means of communication between the government and organization is through coordinators. The predominant, predominant form of exchange information are annual report, funding requests, and actual policies. So data primarily serves to substantiate funding requests instead of being used to improve service, 
services, track progress, and promote synergy rather, rather than siloing. Consequently, employees lack policy knowledge, leading staff to have a lower, lower sense of efficacy and a disconnection between policies and the realities people face. Additionally, people, uh, additionally, executive staff and frontline workers feel marginalized, employee turnover hampers communication effectiveness, and barriers hinder long-term goal participation and direction clarity. These combined factors create a challenging environment that requires urgent atten attention and strategic intervention. So as the former three themes demonstrate, service providers have complicated feelings about homelessness planning and the associated expectations that are placed on their agencies to conform. Participant attitudes towards organizational change are often directly tied to their inclusion or lack of in the consultation process, unstable and inflexible resources, and inadequate communication flow and data tracking across organizations. While some participants did express concerns or negative attitudes towards organizational changes that result from homelessness planning, such attitudes often did not extend to their feelings about systems planning more broadly. So this study provides evidence that service providers are willing and eager to engage in best practices stipulated by homelessness planning, and the aforementioned themes often act as barriers for them being able to do so. So as one frontline worker said, they need to hit the mark. They need to allow us to have enough services or enough staff. It's not that the plans are bad. Even if the plans are adequate, we on the ground, we have to be able to meet the needs and we are not able to do so. So to embed change within organizations, it needs to become cultural and employee attitudes regarding organizational change are ultimately imperative for that change's success. It is therefore crucial that service providers feel represented and supported in homelessness plans for change to be successful within their jurisdiction. So, oh, sorry, okay, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so this comparative case study provides insight into the experiences of agencies within small to mid-sized Canadian cities regarding how they adapt to homelessness plans. Through an analysis of preliminary themes, this project offers a valuable contribution in understanding organizational change in the sector and identifying influential factors that should be the focus of change efforts moving forward. While some of the information from participants can be viewed as critical towards homelessness planning bodies, it's important to emphasize that such feedback from service providers offers the opportunity for change and provides valuable insights to homelessness planning bodies regarding the development and implementation of plans. So given that employee attitudes towards change are key to change's success, focus needs to be placed on service provider buy-in moving forward. This can be done through a variety of avenues. So first, there needs to be effective consultation processes with all level of, levels of employment, not just uh, executive administrators. There also needs to be adequate support through stable and sufficient resource allocation. Enhanced resources are ultimately required to heighten interagency communication and ensure consistency in terms of employment and quality employees. In Sherbrooke, they have a regional network that has proven invaluable to formulating effective local strategies and fostering dialogue about transformative change at the provincial level. While Kelowna also has a variety of interagency tables for collaboration, adequate resources are required to allocate staff for engaging in these strategic meetings for systems planning. So the question arises of whether a policy overhaul is required. Most participants replied somewhat in the affirmative, although with certain caveats. Ultimately, in the absence of developing and implementing approaches that seek to redirect policies beyond their original intent, ad hoc or incomplete fixes end up being applied to existing policy that result in policy layering. So new ideas are, apl are applied or layered onto old frameworks, which results in incremental change or the status quo. Given service providers' enthusiasm for systems planning in general, adequate consultation, resources, and communication have the potential to move jurisdictions beyond siloed practices 
to engage in more innovative homelessness planning within and across communities. So in terms of limitations and conclusion, this study would benefit from a larger pilot sample. It's obviously not generalizable because it was exploratory. And it would also benefit from exploring the lived experience of service users to gain a more wholesome perspective of people's experiences with homelessness plans on the ground. Ultimately, we conclude, conclude by emphasizing that there is the need to move beyond cognitive biases, biases in systems planning, the idea that we know best, toward accomplishing heightened service improvement and fidelity to homelessness plans and initiatives. Understanding and addressing the challenges faced by service providers in relation to these four themes is crucial for moving forward with the development and success of homelessness plans moving forward. Thank you so much. If you would like more information, you can look to the Kelowna Homelessness Research Center or ask.khrc at ubc.ca. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Andrew Thornton. I work for the Nanaimo Systems Planning Organization and I swear I've never met these people before and I haven't read their research before. It's just a, uh, a proviso as I, um, honestly, I didn't copy their research. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's the title um, and very much um, what we want to do is what it says there, initiate a national dialogue. Um, about medium-sized communities, and I'll, I'll come back to um, why that's, or I'll, I'll begin to tell you why that's so. Um, Got to put my glasses on. Okay, so our, our aim today is to, initially we were, uh, had done a research project on where not Nanaimo sits in terms of comparative homelessness on a per capita basis. Um, but today we want to really focus on what medium-sized communities might be, how they might operate differently, and how they might be leading transformations in policy and practice, as we've just seen, in terms of uh, addressing homelessness. Um, why do we want to focus on medium-sized communities? Because I think if you even look in the program here of some 230, 250 papers, I think you find that word maybe five times. Um, so there's obviously a gap. The really $3 word is lacunae. Um, I don't use that word, um, but I just did. Um, and the other one is to begin to start this conversation to identify the, the potential unique and innovative innovations that come from, are they small cities? Are they medium cities? That's part of the conversation. And I think, um, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you, but we already have evidence. You're calling them small cities. We're calling them medium-sized cities. Um, we could probably go around and everyone to have a different, different definition. It's not about pinning it down. It points to exactly the problem uh, that we're, we're trying to, to address here. Um, and in particular, perfect example, how does, how does, a medium, how does being a medium-sized community impact policy and practice? and how does policy and practice impact what's done in medium-sized communities, as you've already identified. And I'm gonna say in the next slide, or no, John's gonna say it later, but I'll presage it. Um, tends to be uh, assumption of one size fits all. Um, had a nice quote in my blog, like the emperor in Amadeus, you know, scalability, just take out a few notes and it'll be perfect, <laughs> right? Same thing with scalability in medium and small communities. Just, just scale it down and it'll work. Um, not so much. 
Um, oh, I keep looking at. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so this is our study. It's based on, um, like we said, and you can see there's two of the communities that were mentioned in here. Um, and we were trying to understand where Nanaimo stood in relative terms, mathematical terms. Um, we used pick count data from 2018. We were going to use 2020 pick count data, but we were one of the five communities in all of Canada that actually got our pick count in before COVID started. Um, so we do have some comparative data from 2020 in the study as well, which you can find on our website, nanaimosbo.com. Um, and not just 100,000. So you see some people saying, hey, Brandon doesn't have 100,000. But we wanted to try to get as much a spread as possible across Canada. But also we were trying to look at communities, cities that were relatively geographically isolated. Unlike, say, you know, looking at Toronto, where does Toronto begin and Brampton end? Mississauga, mm, hard to say. Um, so that, that's why we um, were focusing in particular on these 10. And what we can see, Nanaimo, in relative terms, if you were in one of the sessions yesterday, the national average in 2023 was 13 per 10,000. Nanaimo's 40 or 50. Um, so we're, it's bad everywhere. It's real bad in Nanaimo. So that's, and we, we found, that's what we found out. We, there's the math. You can't argue with me. You, you can't argue with me. There's lots to argue about. Um, <laughs> The other thing, one of the things that emerged from this study as well, and I think, is it a characteristic of medium-sized communities or not, or bigger? There's a skewed kind of uh, income distribution in the NIMO that uh, we were talking about core housing need yesterday, and that's related to income distribution. And what we can see with the NIMO has a very high percentage, and you might point out the quintiles aren't equal, doesn't matter. Um, the NIMO has twice as many as the national average on the higher income bracket. So there's something going on <laughs> in relation to homelessness and income brackets and core housing need um, and might be something to look at in other medium-sized cities. These are just, um, we're number one in these, not number one we want to be. Um, they, they don't, uh, Andrew's not real popular <laughs> with the city council when he comes to them and says, by the way, we have the highest per capita this and that, that and all these bad problems. Um, but that's why you do research, try to change the conversation, as somebody said earlier. So basically, um, in the end of the study about the comparative, we said we've got, I know there's a movie called The Perfect Storm, um, but we have a perfect storm, and the perfect storm of housing instability is spread across the country, um, but we, we found it first. No, we didn't. Um, <laughs> but this, we finished the study in about January, 2021, or mid-January, mid-2021, mid and this is what's going on in Nanaimo, and it may be relevant for these similar 100,000-ish communities that are isolated, and it's around, uh, Nanaimo has high livability factors, we can debate what those are, um, but also the other things are very common in other places, no housing stock, high average rents, lots of people in core housing need, you all know the, you all know the patterns. But what Nanaimo also has is, um, the same as Halifax, is growing very quickly. In the previous census, 16, 2016 to 2021, Nanaimo was number five fastest growing community in Canada. Had a 10% increase in population in a five year period. That's, so there's, I'm sure there's data that shows population increase equals homelessness increase. Um, so that's what we found. Um, however, uh, so I've already summarized the, but one of the things that did come from this is what's already been said, demonstration, locally driven solutions driven by local data from people on the ground. I mean, that's what we found as well. Um, that's what people were saying to us, you know. There's, there's lots of things going on. Even though what we were looking at was numbers, we also talked to people from across Canada. Not everyone, we didn't talk to everyone. I haven't talked to everyone in here. Um, but that was the thing, right? Locally driven. And this is where it began to shift. We went from mathematical, demographic, to there's something else going on. What are the stru structural drivers of homelessness? 
what are the structural unique features of medium-sized communities that's driving homelessness? Is it different from large urban centers? Which I think we can agree what that is. Um, but the question is, and now I'll turn it over to John, we actually went looking for one thing and we found another, which is in research, you know, you're, that's, what's, that's what's supposed to happen. You want to find what you were looking for, but you hope, against all hope, that you find something uh, unique and different that you weren't, weren't expecting. Just the site that changed the slide. Yeah. Okay. So I'll turn that over to you. Yeah. Thanks. Good mid-morning, everyone. You've had your coffee. You're all good. Uh, my name's John McCormick, and uh, I'm also with the Nanaimo System Planning Organization, the Executive Director. Um, just by show of hands, how many people here would identify as being from, let's say, a medium-sized community? How many from small community? How many from a large center? Okay, that's good. Right so, old. yeah, that's right. Congratulations, <laughs> that's right. So, um, you just you can just go through slides as I'm talking, and okay. it sort of makes sense. Uh, so. Uh, We'd, we sort of uh, would argue that um, in terms of medium-sized cities and the approach to connectivity among service providers, this is really where we started to kind of understand that there was some uh, unique qualities around medium and smaller communities that was really, uh, uh, from a practice perspective and maybe from a policy perspective, made them unique. And, uh, and again, the reason why we thought, hmm, this makes sense that we start having a national conversation about this. So we argue that, um, that most uh, service sector frameworks have been developed in large urban centers. And uh, with a distinct focus on enhancing the connections between community agencies. And uh, our research highlighted the fact that this uh, is a pre-existing condition of medium-sized communities. And you probably found this out in your research too, that everyone knows everyone. And being from Kelowna and Sherbrooke, maybe Sherbrooke's a little larger, but um, it, certainly in Kelowna, you would, you would find if you talk to the service providers, and if I look around the room, you might, I might get a, a nod or two from people to say, yeah, we know everyone who's, who's doing the work in the community. We might even know many of the people who are, uh, who are dealing with on the street. We, we know them by name. We see them every day. Our community is you know, very definable geographically. There's a lot of nodded heads here. So um, uh, in Nanaimo, the implications of coordinated access has merit. And it kind of reinforces um, things that we already had in place. Um, so maybe it enhances it a little bit. But uh, at the same time, it didn't really create something new. So um, it built on rather than sort of created agency connections. And that's an important piece that I think we all can kind of agree on as well. So this interpretation opens the door to consider, uh, the, consider, or to consider the, uh, the expectations of scalability as, as was already addressed, but also sort of uh, to start to think about how these policy uh, decisions are made and maybe we, uh, we need to think about it in terms of the size of the community. How geographically distinct is it? What its shape is, and I, I often describe uh, communities as hamburgers and hot dogs. On the west coast, Nanaimo's a hot dog. It's long and thin, it's 30, almost 30 kilometers long and about four kilometers wide. So that means if you're delivering services in the downtown core in Nanaimo, you've left about 15 kilometers of service uh, in the downtown core. That's interesting. Um, maybe in another place like Peterborough, Ontario, that's more like a hamburger, you can have centralized services and everyone can access them. So that's interesting. Um, so um, as Andrew said, the simply too many notes is a very interesting piece because I think that's what we've heard from, you know, just take it down a notch, just reduce the tone a little, take a couple of things out and it'll be fine in your smaller community. We found that uh, we're dealing with coordinated access, for example, that my goodness, we, we have coordinated access, we know each other, we interact, we have tables, we, we talk. One of my colleagues is in the back of the room, Jason Harrison, he could tell you the uh, the um, budgets of every organization in the city. He could tell you how many staff they have. He could tell you who they deal with and what their programs are. He could tell you everything about them. And I'm sure around the room you could probably find uh, that that's similar. So maybe if we want, we'll do a little exercise. You want to maybe do a little exercise with me? Everyone stand up. Now I don't want you to go crazy here, but if you want to stretch or something just to kind of get the blood flowing again, it always feels nice. Put your arms together. 
Somebody in the front here is practicing a little MMA. Don't do that. Just take it. You don't hurt anyone besides you. Maybe you had a shake. Okay. If you're from a large urban center or you're from government and you, uh, you can't describe everyone in your community who you're working with or who you're helping, just sit down. Okay. Good. Okay. That's a good group. Um, so if you're in, uh, let's say, if you're an elected official in the city, have a seat as well. Okay? Good. This is a lot of people who know. So how many of you would say in your community that you know all the community agencies uh, that, you, that are working in your community by a show of hands? More or less. What's that? More or less. More or less, yeah. So anyone else who didn't put their hand up, you can sit down as well. Okay, how many of your communities are over 100,000? Okay, you guys sit down. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna pick now and just maybe say, if someone wants to tell me what your community is and how big your, your community is. Maybe the gentleman right here in the front. Uh, population around 27,000. Okay, 27,000. Anyone under 50,000, sit down. Because we already know who you are. Okay. Yeah. Under 50. Under 50, sit down, over 50, stay up. So 50 to 100,000, okay? So now maybe the person in the front here, Angela, is it Angela? Yes, 80,000. 80,000 people. Do you know every single community agency? Um, yeah, roughly, yeah. Roughly, right? And, and you know how many people are living shel unsheltered or? No, that's why I'm here. Oh, you don't know. <laughs> okay. We don't know either. We don't know always either, that's right. Um, but you kind of have a sense, right, of what's going on, and you know the resources that are available. Anyone else? Another community, maybe? Sure. As I was on the slide, Brandon, Manitoba. Okay. We're about 50,000 in one. Yeah. 50,000 in one? <laughs> Just above the wire, that's good. Yes. Annapolis Valley, and it's stretched out for 120,000. So you've got a similar problem to Nanaimo where you're stretched out, right? And you're trying to deliver services. That's interesting. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, one more down there. Love Summerside. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so you get a sense, right, that there's, a, there's an interesting conversation to be had here. So, um, uh, so how are we doing on time? You good? <laughs> Keeping you too entertained? Uh, like five minutes. Yeah. Okay, good. Lots of time. Good. Uh, so um, this strong relationship that exists between community agencies is a real powerful strength. And, Andrews just put up here on this, this slide from uh, July of this year, I think it was, where the province, uh, the Minister of Housing said, we're gonna, we want uh, everyone to meet housing targets. N notwithstanding the fact that you know, Vancouver has much more resources in their city uh, than Nanaimo does, they can move things light, like lightning relative to other communities. Nanaimo's got no developable land to speak of. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's interesting how these conversations can't possibly be the same. They can't possibly be the same. If we, if we now sort of extrapolate that to a national um, or provincial level, it's a similar kind of a thing. And yet there's a feeling that these policies are, com are sort of coming from one place and we're having to kind of uh, make them work in each of our communities in a similar way. So that's really the, what we're trying to say. Yes. And I do love the fact that in the Nanaimo uh, news media outlet, there's uh, an ad for apartments to rent in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a thing, isn't it? So, um, so these features of medium-sized communities uh, interventions are worth a closer look. And we hope that our presentation will serve to start what is a, we hope is more of a national dialogue. And, I know that uh, Brian is an elected official, sorry Brian for outing you here, from uh, Sarnia. And uh, I think that communities like that would like to be a part of that conversation. We'd like to be a part of the conversation. Researchers would like to be a part of that conversation. And I think that by doing so, we can bring forward uh, some suggestions, some uh, recommendations, and some observations about what's going on in medium-sized communities that can really help to move things along. Uh, so the aim is to stimulate that nationwide conversation. Um, about the nature of service delivery in medium-sized communities that will both inform local service delivery, which you guys looked at, and also uh, provincial and federal policy considerations. So uh, I'll maybe just leave it at that and uh, thank everyone for, uh, for listening to our presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.
yeah, we'll Good make one. it. I have an ongoing life challenge with uh, podiums. <laughs> I'm often the same height as them, uh, which makes it really fun for me. But here we are. All right, what a full room. It's great to see you all. Um, we are totally jumping coast, and we're going from the west coast to the east coast. Uh, so our group up here is from, Russ just spoke to it, one of our community. Also, is this really loud, or is it just me? We're good? OK. Um, we are from the Annapolis Valley region and a bit stretching further than that in Nova Scotia. Um, for folks who know, you might recognize this photo. It's from the Look Off in our region, as known slight tourism plug in case you're staying in the area. Um, but just so you know, we're about uh, coming from around an hour to an hour and a half from here, except we also have a provincial partner up with us who's coming from much further away, three hours? Four hours. Oh no, it's about four or five hours. Four or five hours, amazing. Um, and one thing I'm noticing is this is a moment where I can see why the conference organizers put us here. A lot of the work that was just spoken to around collective impact and um, coordinated access and service-based data collection, um, it, we really uh, mirror what you folks were talking about on this side of the country. So we will dive in. We are talking about humanizing the data through service-based counts and vulnerable sector advocacy. And there was a land acknowledgement. We just want to add that this is a really important part of our work and that in Nova Scotia, we also recognize the 400 years of African history and that that's a unique, distinct group who's enriched our culture here. And we do want to name that um, part of this is action and the need to engage in the work, reconciliation, equity, diversity, and accessibility. And that I often use this moment as a reminder that our language can frame how we do the work. And in the English language, we have so many words for poor or lesser than or without. And in local Mi'kmaq language, there's no word for poor and 25 words for community. So I think that really speaks to the kind of work that we do and how it frames it. So today we're gonna do an introduction with the lovely humans on stage beside me, uh, a speak to service-based counts and what they offer in rural areas, and we'll close out with some resources. I also have a printout in my bag in case you want one, though there's more of you than I expected, so <laughs> maybe share, um, but it's just a, a printed notes on tips for success in this, in this in rural areas if you're at all curious, and our communities range in size from anywhere between 6,000 to 25, thousand to more than 25,000, I would say, depending on where we are at. Um, but yeah, let's dive into it. I'm going to toss it over to the table here to Kim to introduce who you are and the representation or the organization you're representing. Hi, is, can everybody hear me okay? Is this on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kim Kent. I'm the co-founder and director of Posse, Peer Outreach Support Services and Education. My pronouns are she, they. Um, I also come with some lived experience as a former youth runaway. Basically, Posse trains youth in harm reduction and human rights. And then uh, we do street level outreach in the communities of Windsor West Hance, Sabiganegadi, and Sackville, Nova Scotia. Uh, we're also in the midst of developing a non-police mental health and addiction crisis response model for rural areas. Amazing, thanks Kim. Peggy? Hello everyone, my name is Peggy Vassello and I am a consultant with Public Health. Um, and um, as part of the team that I am on, we work in housing and homelessness, and a lot of uh, my coworkers are here. <laughs> Thanks, shout out to you guys. Um, but, uh, but so at Public Health, we are positioned in the community, really, to kind of have support the work and the research, and, um, and it's really a big piece of what we do. Thank you. And uh, my name's Alicia Christie, my pronouns are she, her. And as many of you in the room, I'm sure you wear multiple hats depending on which space you're in. Today I'm wearing the Homeless No More hat, uh, which is an initiative that focuses on supporting a dynamic sector. The, essentially, we're supporting the folks who support the folks. Someone said that yesterday, and I want to quote them, but I, I thought I saw them in this room, but those are not my words, those are someone else's words. Um, but the intent is, through Homeless No More, that we amplify their work, um, connect services and resources, influence policy, funding, and systems change, 
and then support organizations in advocacy specifically with a data collection element to our work, specifically the service-based counts. Um, for those of you, just for a quick definition, if you've heard of a pit count, service-based counts model that, particularly in rural areas. We work with service providers to identify folks using supports who are experiencing a form of homelessness. We use the Canadian Observatory definition on homelessness, so precariously housed, emergency sheltered, fully unsheltered, or at risk of homelessness. So across Mi'kma'ki, Nova Scotia, we are witnessing and experiencing the impacts of the housing and homelessness crisis, as are all of you in this room. And the sector needed data to support and represent the true work that they were doing as well as the individuals they support as whole humans and all that they are and not just their experience of homelessness. That data is a tool to humanize the experience of rural homelessness. Um, in our region, when they first started conducting the counts in 2020, um, through our partner organization, Acadia University, Mary Sweetman is our lead um, professor on that. Uh, in between that time, between 2020 and 2022, the organizations who participated in the count received $2 million more in funding than they had ever before, um, mainly because not only do we have the testimonies, we now have the data to back it up, and we can pair it. And in rural areas, now that I know many of you are less than 5,000 or 50,000, you know that you might be one organization and you are everything in that community. You do every service possible, because there's not multiple, it's just you. Um, so that's the work that we are hoping to represent and capture. But to help model that work, Homeless No More is led by the sector. Beside me is the sector, <laughs> um, essentially. <laughs> so we're going to dive into some questions, and they'll, they'll, they'll respond. We have two questions and then some closing, and then we are here to dive into more of how to do the work. And there is a presentation this afternoon with some of our partners, Kristen's in the room, um, a little bit more on what it looks like, and there's so many resources on how to actually implement a count. We're going to speak to what it does for you. So the first question uh, for Peggy and Kim is based on your experience, why do we use a community support and service-based count in rural areas? And I believe we're starting with Peggy on this one. Okay, um, so can everyone hear me okay? Is this all right? All right, perfect. Um, so I have to really kind of bring us back to 2015, I believe it was. I wasn't with public health then, but I was a housing first case, case manager in Sydney and we had received the toolkit to do the pit count and um, we, a, a research committee we sat around and we thought is this really going to represent our community and uh, so we thought you know you talked about the geography um, of some of them we, so we uh, were representing the um, Cape Breton Regional Municipality and we have a city, Sydney, but we also have a very rural um, and small town kind of, uh, kind of other communities as part of the, and we're very vast in, in geography. So we just kind of thought, this is not gonna really gonna cut it for us for doing the pig count. We will do the pig count. And um, you know we still do the pick count, but we want to do we want to kind of think of something else that's going to kind of speak to what it is that we want to do. So we public health came on board um, and the university, Cape Breton University, and a couple other community organizations, and we thought about you know using service provision as a way to kind of do an indirect um, estimate count, and we kind of. We knew that a lot of service providers probably were interacting with people experiencing homelessness. We knew that they had a lot of knowledge and, and information to share. So for instance, um, so um, like the local library. So library staff would come to us and say, you know, we have people coming in here, like this senior veteran who comes in all the time to read the paper, and we know that he is, you know, sleeping in a shed, you know, in a small community, and he gets into Sydney when he can, and we're helping him, but, you know, how does that speak to uh, how we can get this known in the community? And so, so those are the kinds of examples that we were wanting to kind of get to. Um, so then we developed a standardized tool, data collection tool, with, with uh, the local uh, university and public health. 
and uh, moved from there. And we've been doing service-based counts for, um, this will be our fourth one coming up in, tw in 2024. And we've expanded the service-based count, uh, not only outside our uh, municipal region to 10 other uh, municipalities, what's called in our health zone, um, to, to include our entire health zone. Mm -hmm. So um, it's provided us with a lot of information. So. That's really the experience of the service-based count in, in the Eastern Zone. Thanks for that, and Kim? So our experience uh, with Posse, and we were working in West Hans, Windsor West Hans, uh, it allows for more than one full day or even a half a day to count people, um, which was respects us as human beings working the front line, but also respects the human beings who um, might have been out of town or un not able to be found that day. Um, so I found that that was really important that it just ha helped us capture some of the rural hidden homelessness, uh, giving us more time. Um, and it captures individuals who are uh, homeless but not houseless. And when I say that, I mean that um, some people can have a shelter but it not be safe and home should be a place that feels safe. So it allows us to catch the folks who are living precariously um, and in violent situations. Uh, and we saw the vulnerability of them actually not having shelter when COVID hit. It changed that for folks. Mm -hmm. um, and it addresses community assets, the connections to community, the sense of belonging. I think it really honors like a place and land and, and then starts to really decolonize the traditional pit count. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. And just to build on what Kim was saying there, in our service-based counts, we ask questions on what connections do people have? What assets do they have? And I know, um, I'm not sure if the Rural Development Network is in the room, but they recently were doing work as well on further expanding on capturing the assets in, in service-based counts. So that's another resource to lean on as well. The second question for you both is what has the count meant for you, your organization, and your community? So uh, it validates our experience, like as one of the only organizations that was actually working with people in the community who are experiencing homelessness, it brings visibility to what was otherwise fairly invisible. Um, and it being uh, outside perspective, uh, kind of doesn't just make us look like a special interest group, like we are kind of being reduced to we're biased and maybe, you know, uh, inflating the situation. Um, so that brings up objective perspective. It values our time and relationships with people. Uh, I think that's really important. And, uh, and then it allows us to advocate for funding support. Um, last winter we had uh, a few days of like minus 37 and we were able for the first time to get like a warming shelter opened up in our community. Um, so that was helpful. Uh, allows us to con continue to advocate for harm reduction supported housing and the need for that in our communities. Um, it's created local action uh, committees mm -hmm. on homelessness, which is also really great to bring us all together and start to address the issue as a community. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. And Peggy? Yeah, and, and just what, to what Kim said, um, you know, reaching out to all the service providers and using the, the standardized tool and, and the, the definitions, again, we used from the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. Um, it really kind of, back in 2015, it really brought everybody together and around this topic area. There was a lot of new learning that had to happen, a lot of training around the tool. And as we went forward, we developed with what was a core small research committee is now a very vibrant, very large uh, affordable housing and homelessness uh, working group that's, I don't know, I'm guessing it's over 30 members now. <laughs> Um, meet monthly and we are consistently advocating and building on the knowledge that we have in our communities around homelessness and also we because we were able to get the information that you know that kind of led us to develop the trends and what we were seeing we were able to target our um, our responses you know when we saw trends in youth homelessness in our community and things like that so we were able to to advocate and get funding to to uh, to meet those challenges, and I would have to say that mo importantly, 
is like that collective impact approach or that community development approach that, you know, in the first, um, when you talked about the service providers mm -hmm. at the first of it and, and how they want to be on board and they want, but they, to be part of the planning and the whole thing. Well, this happened. So we have this sort of collective impact where we're working together and um, we're stronger because of it, I would have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Oh, well, this is squished together. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> community support and service-based counts are known as the best practice of capturing the lived experience of rural homelessness. Um, it's a tricky thing to capture, as I'm sure many of you have witnessed. It's dynamic. It's changing. There's different assumptions in rural areas, that classic rural, picturesque, everyone knows each other, everyone's supported by each other. But there's, there's another side to that, and this came up in the conversations around encampments uh, yesterday, and an encampment of 100 people in a city center, we don't want that, it's harmful, et cetera. An encampment of 10 to 15 people in a rural community, they are known by name, their faces are known, they are deeply, deeply stigmatized. It impacts their ability to get jobs or rental units because they're, quote, those people. And they are, it's really hard to break out of that system because you're not invisible in those cases. Everyone knows who you are. And there's this idea that we can talk about them or it's a problem we have to solve or that our business, I've heard it in so many spaces so far, our business providers being like, well, we have to do something about those people, the homelessness population. Um, and it's really challenging because those people that they're talking about are in the same rooms or on those same Facebook pages or whatever else they might be saying. So it, sh it shows up differently. It's a different experience that's really raw and really vulnerable. So what we hope with service-based counts is, is connecting with each other and feeling it with each other because it's heavy in rural areas in the sector. It is no matter where you are. Um, but the hope is that we can capture the work of service providers, give the nod to them, because unfortunately we're all doing work that shouldn't exist. This conference shouldn't exist, we shouldn't be talking about this. Um, so that's a hard thing to swallow and it, it's not an accident we got here. And I know Kim has some great wording on that as well if you want to add. So the data focuses on the individual and their experience. Um, but homelessness is really the, the f the result of faulty capitalist policies and the commodification of basic human needs. Housing is a basic human right and it's not the moral failing of any individual. It's systemic change and economic changes that need to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a round of applause on that one. And the hope with bringing the asset-based questions into a service-based count is to help tell the true story of what it means. The reality is all of us are closer to homelessness than we are to being a millionaire. Um, so just speaking to that and that lived reality is, is a huge part of this work and naming that and bringing the, the human empathy side into the work. So um, we do wanna thank you for listening. Merci, Walalin. Um, there is resources. Um, these are clickable links. I know this will be posted on the session website, so you can click on these links. I also have a handout hiding over here that maybe I'll put at the back of the room. Um, yeah, there's so many resources out there. We are not the only group doing service-based counts. There's so much feedback. There's so much perspective. Lean on each other, learn from each other, and the biggest thing is to let the sector lead the work and let the sector lead the questions. Um, so thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it back to our moderator. Um, that was such a great way to bring things home uh, and don't really want to follow that uh, now. Uh, but the good thing is we're open for questions. I also want to say uh, thanks for that activity. Uh, I live in Hamilton. I'm 500,000. I sat down very quickly. Um, but fortunate in my work, I hear a lot of communities that are very frustrated with the lack of just not being recognized in all in solutions because they're from smaller communities. So appreciate that we had this session today to have space for this conversation and love the idea of having this national dialogue and um, yeah, so having said that, so we've got, um, 
you guys are a very easy panel to moderate. You stayed in time, your presentations were awesome. So we've got time for, oh, someone's already standing there, like, stop talking, Erica, let me ask this question. Uh, do folks, panelists, do you want to all come up here? Or, yeah, I see them, maybe not so many. You do whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> but bring on the questions and they will, they will get response. You're shy. Hi. 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 Uh, we know you. What? If you ask a question and then someone, someone will, will respond, like repeat the question. So again, so we're able to okay. Okay. Allie Ryder, yeah. what do you want to ask? Uh, my question is for the first uh, group. I was curious about how you selected those three communities. Obviously, they're all mid size, and that's great. One of your key findings was about the lack of data sharing, and I do a lot of work with Hypus. Um, I can tell you that for those of you not aware, it is now required for communities to start using. I know that one of your key findings was a lack of data sharing. I'm wondering if, like, how you picked them and how your findings, your findings will probably be different if you included some other um, communities that are using Canvas, because I think probably more than half of the communities across Canada are. So, I guess the question was, how did you pick them and um, maybe consider expanding? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, in terms of how the communities were selected, I don't know that either of us can speak to that in intense detail because we are the research assistants. Um, so John Graham, the principal investigator, was supposed to be here. He is not, um, but he would be a good person to email about that, but I will bring this feedback to him for sure. In terms of the HIFIS, um, this was actually identified particularly in Kelowna. I conducted the interviews in Kelowna. Um, as a difficult thing to accomplish due to lack of resources. So when talking about how some of these themes reinforce one another, data collection was perceived to be a really useful tool if they could dedicate staff and resources to doing the thing. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so that's really, um, yes, we are, certainly aware that these three communities are not currently adhering to HIFAS. Um, it's something that in Kelowna's context, they're currently working towards a by name list and all of that good stuff. Um, but the resource allocation, the, this community in Kelowna is already stretched so thin that to be able to accomplish that is really a daunting task. So. And also, um, if I may, there's also a, a cultural component that, that, that comes into that that I, I think it's really interesting. In Sherbrooke, for example, not in every community organization and nonprofits, but there is this um, <clears throat> attention to really, it's, it's cultural. They don't want to share data because they want to preserve privacy. They want to preserve confidentiality. And I know that in other provinces, because we, we were in three provinces, it's something that it's, that it's perceived differently. But also, as Katie said, the, the thing is, uh, uh, even in Sherbrooke, there was some community organization that would like to take the time, that would like to use the, those, those data to, to uh, improve their services, but they don't have the time, they don't have the, the, the flexibility to do it, but still there is some a table, consultation table uh, as, we, as we spoke about it. But other than that, it's, it's really cultural and, and also lack of resources. But how, how do, does, because the, for, for the sake of uh, uh, people who are listening to it, the, the, the question was how did we uh, choose the, the, the cities we, it's, it's mostly demographic, and uh, I don't know, as Katie said, John, John Graham would be able to, <laughs> to answer that question. We are here on his behalf. Thank you for the question, though. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to, if I can, just speak also to uh, the BC context, because that matters. Um, B, in, in, and it sounds like Quebec has a similar kind of challenge. In BC, it's uh, the uh, only license for HIFAS is uh, held by BC Housing at this point. And so they're, they're in the process of working with communities to try to open that up. Uh, but it's been a very difficult process to, to get there. And other communities across the country, uh, I think of you know, mo most of the designated communities, I think, uh, or many of them, uh, are using HIFAS. And, uh, and it is an, can be an effective tool. So in BC, we feel uh, like we wish we had access to that tool, and we would certainly use it. Um, and we're hopeful that in the next six months or year, we may be able to do so. 
Hi, my question is to the last group that spoke in regards to pit count and homelessness and how you uh, gather the information. In Ontario, uh, most of our clients are social assistants, so they do not want to declare to be homeless because they're going to lose their shelter portion. Is it the same in your province? Or are you dealing with the same issues? So, um, The PIC count's anonymous, and so, our, well, the, the service based count's anonymous, so we're able to capture folks who are still receiving income assistance, and they trust us, so they know, like, we have relationship, because as it was indicated, everybody knows everybody, so I'm well trusted, uh, and so there, there wasn't that concern with us. Now, if they were also being asked the same questions by DCS workers, would they be honest? No. Right, which is why it's so important to have service-based organizations working from a harm reduction perspective and lens in a community. Because people will come with a different level of trust and disclose a lot more information than they will to somebody who has the potential to take away their small living portion. I get that, but how do you truly identify the home, like for the by names list, how do you truly identify the homeless if they're not going to tell you they're homeless? But they're telling me they're homeless. But So, yeah, so the tool, what we do when we collect the data is that what we, first of all, we, we uh, train the uh, service, the people that are going to participate in the study. Um, so they provide non-identifying uh, information and they fill out the survey tool. And when they do that, we have a unique identifier that they would have, that they would place. And so that when, we, when we go through the results, we look at um, duplication and that unique identifier helps with duplication in the study. And so the, so the person, uh, so the service, the, it's actually key informant information is what you're collecting. So you're collecting things, you're collecting from data sources like the health authority that because we have a research ethics application, we, we, we partner with the university and it's, it's a research-based study. Um, we also go through provincial uh, ethics review and uh, approvals. So we're able to have provincial organizations that have uh, data level information that they can provide through the services that they have and also the service providers, which is the biggest probably source of where you're gonna get your data from. And um, yeah, so that's how we kind of collect. It's kind of a tool that collects that information. But is an individual's name put on the by name list, not unless we have a conversation and ask oh, them yeah. if they want to go? Yeah, yeah, that's different, yeah. But, but that's the way that we're defining true homelessness and through our by name list. So this is my yeah. question is like, are we really doing the right thing? Are, are, are we identifying and are we helping the people the right way? Is my that's a very good question. That is a very good question. And I, you know, here I was in some, some talks yesterday that, you know, use the by names list to kind of do their enumerations and things like that. So, and there's more of that. So, um, can I add to that then? And this is one more reason why we need universal basic income so that people aren't penalized for being homeless and taking like the, the little bit of resource they have um, being at risk and being taken away from them. My, my belief. I feel like I'm changing the conversation, so I'm feeling like a little weird about it, but <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, thank you all for this, uh, this panel. I'm so excited that Mid-Sized Cities is like at CA, like it's a thing at CAA, it's like very, very exciting. So really grateful to all of you. Uh, my name's Erin Day, uh, and I'm a, a researcher at Laurier, and I've been doing research on Mid-Sized Cities uh, as well. And so I just wanted to put this to all of you. One of the things that we're finding in our research is that the um, extent of visible homelessness, so I fully recognizing that hidden homelessness has been in rural and mid-sized cities for a long time, but this visible homelessness is rel relatively new. Um, and that's creating a lot of tension 
and really struggling. So, you know, even your, your student comment, everybody knows everybody, what we're hearing is even from folks who are homeless are saying like, I don't know who these people beside me are anymore. Like, it's actually not so much everybody knows everybody anymore because it's growing so fast. And, um, and that relatively new visibility is creating a whole level of stigma and um, vitriol uh, 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 and tension that I, don't, that I don't think exists in Toronto, you know, where it's not a surprise to see people who are homeless or, or whatever it is. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that, like um, this relatively new phase of homelessness that, yeah, that, that mid-sized cities are in. If we kind of toss it back and forth. Um, there's multiple people in this room are from where <laughs> I'm coming from, uh, and we are living this really deeply right now. Um, and I'm going to say in the town of Kentville, uh, in Nova Scotia, it's become much more visible, and I would say all of us are arriving very raw, because our community is being, as to be expected, the NIMBY has gone out of this world. It's just so unexpected and so intense. And I'm looking at the faces in the room who are feeling it a lot. I'm getting teary eyed right here. But I think it's that real transition in rural area, though the organizations in the room have been supporting folks for a long time. And now our community is starting to see it and make comments on it that are really harmful to our sector and to our, to our community. So I appreciate you uh, naming that. Um, and you're right, there is a lot new, a lot more folks or new folks coming and we might not know who they are. Um, from our perspective, the, the service providers are supporting individuals from as far as three or four hours away because they're being sent to our community because the services are there in the rural areas. Um, and then they're displaced from where they call home. And that's a whole other layer of support. And I think someone else was going to speak to this question as well. I don't want to take up too much space. Um, thanks for that question, Erin. Um, uh, so I, I'll start it this way by saying uh, Vancouver Island is, uh, is sort of interesting because uh, it is in the warmest part of Canada and it is a, an island surrounded by a moat, as it were. Uh, there's a reason that uh, when um, Harry and Meghan got kicked out of uh, Buckingham Palace, they went to Vancouver Island first. It's becoming a sort of a plan B place uh, for wealth uh, and that is driving uh, locally um, sort of generated homelessness uh, and so uh, there are new faces every day um, uh, on the island uh, but at the same time there's a lot of you know everyone there's there's a fairly consistent group so we sort of think about it in terms of a, a circle or circuit of people who are moving around the island trying to find a way to survive um, but they are uh, they are uh, by and large um, coming from Vancouver Island to start with or have been there for quite a while let Andrew answer a little bit of it from the pit count as well. Sorry, I'm going to make a slightly different point. I've already had a brief conversation with Aaron about this. And I, I think one of the things that's happening um, in terms of uh, homelessness and kind of how it's being, and visible homelessness, I think it's a, and the responses to it are a new type of what I would call new eth ethnocentrism. And it's it's part of the politics of difference where, you know, the, the, the other is identified by a particular set of characteristics, put in a box, and then we understand them, and we, we don't have to pay attention anymore. Or we, it, calls out, it calls out policing, it calls out moral panics, right? And that's, that's what visible homelessness is doing. What we know from the presentations is homelessness is more than the visible homelessness. Everybody in here knows that, but when somebody you know, in, in the mainstream media just talks about homelessness and what you see is an encampment on a city street, right? They never, they never talk about the variety of homelessness, the complexity of homelessness. And I know how the media works intentionally, but I think that's one, one way of thinking about it is it's an additional part of the politics of difference and a, and a type of, of ethnocentrism um, that is new, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's new and it's old. But anyways, that's, that's a whole nother lecture I can do so much <laughs> So we're seeing, like, there's the folks that everybody knows. We are seeing some people who are, there's like, the city's filled. It's over full. All the resources are capped. And people are like, I'm, I'm out. Like, and then they're, they're coming our way. Um, we have no public transport that connects Windsor West Hants to anywhere else. It's like a bit of an island. 
uh, in way of lack of public transportation. So people get there and then get a little bit stuck uh, and stay for a bit and before they maybe move on and maybe don't. Um, and yet we don't have a shelter in our community uh, available for folks either. So there's definitely been an increase of people calling city council and complaining about the homeless people, some of whom are known, some of who are not. Um, and, and we have our CMP as our police officers. So our CMP, uh, we've been working with them now uh, in how they work more effectively with the, in homeless like encampments with the people within them and responding to community because community is often calling and complaining because the criminalization you mentioned. So um, yeah, we're in a process right now working with some of the folks within the RCMP to look at best practices and how to utilize people like ourselves as like go-between mediators whenever possible to avoid um, the criminalization of people who are experiencing homelessness. So that's some of what we're experiencing. I will pop up just quickly to say that this is a huge issue in Kelowna right now. Um, Kelowna is very much turning into a wealthy retirement community uh, and the increase of visible homelessness. There is a lot of tension in the community um, with business owners and people experiencing homelessness in the service sector. Um, so I would love to chat more about this, um, but one thing I will say, I actually currently reside in Kingston, Ontario. I don't know if anyone here is from there. Um, also happening in Kingston, same kind of reasons. Uh, one thing we've been investigating, is anyone here from Medicine Hat? Yeah, okay, someone here is from Medicine Hat. Um, so one thing we've been investigating is uh, how Medicine Hat at the time where they reduced homelessness according to Built for Zero, how despite having a relatively conservative government, they framed it as an economic issue, uh, which most business owners and taxpayers can get on board with. Um, so how it is less expensive to house people versus providing a bunch of services like shelters that ultimately are not solving the issue. So, um, that's something we're kind of looking into. Um, and obviously I'm not an expert because I don't live in Medicine Hat, but that's a way it's starting to be addressed, I think, is trying to shift the conversation to appeal to business owners or the people who ultimately don't have an understanding of what it means to be unhoused. Thank you for your question. Can I, one more question, is that okay? Yeah. Thanks. Um, my name is Chris. I'm here from uh, Kijiko, and I do Manawaskarini Algonquin Nation area, um, uh, which is known as North Hastings or Bancroft, uh, Ontario. And it's a community about, of about 4,000 um, with a surrounding community of about 12,000. So, and we have, um, we've experienced quite a lot of vitriol directly from the town council as well. And so I wanted to ask for people who are looking into smaller or mid-sized um, communities, what some of the successes or challenges you've had in working with town councils, municipal um, officials. We have like a two-tier um, municipality, so the local officials don't have money. The upper tier officials do. So just any thoughts or reflections you have on that. Thank you. Um, I think your neighbor right beside you can also answer that question very well. <laughs> um, yes, gov I work in government, I work in local government, um, and it is a layer working with especially municipal level council um, and in small communities because it becomes very personable or it's not so much a, a party perspective or et cetera, I mean every level is personal, but in small town municipal, your decisions are impacting your best friends or your closest friends from a, a government perspective. Um, I currently and definitely am sitting just in the challenge, um, not quite seeing the light at the end of the road yet, um, but in conversations here, I think the framing around taxing and really the legal context, there is a unique thing in Nova Scotia that in other provinces, housing isn't actually named under any municipal or government jurisdiction. But in Nova Scotia, our AGM, our, govern our Municipal Government Act, points to the province. 
So you have council saying, well, we don't have any role in housing or homelessness. That's a provincial issue. And I really wish our AGM didn't name it under a specific government because then here we are as staff trying to advocate at the grassroots on here's things our sector, our, our partners in our community are asking of us, but our council is just looking at that AGM document. So I think if you're in another province, definitely look at your government structures and if that housing piece isn't named under any single one, use that, the funding piece, and really, Janine, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamie? Yeah, I'm like, that's, this is the expert sitting right beside you. <laughs> or at least has a more known experience or has had some successes. So I definitely invite that and encourage anyone else up here to speak to this as well. I would just like to add to that, that in the eastern area of Nova Scotia, um, municipalities historically have not been involved in this topic area, but I would dare say that it's new to municipalities, but they're, they're there now, and we are talking with municipalities, um, which is kind of exciting because it brings a whole other um, kind of um, local context to the to the to the quality of like talking to counselors in very remote areas, talking about um, the needs that they see in their community can give you that really defined local context. So um, I would dare say municipalities are getting on board now. So in Sherbrooke, we have this uh, double switch situation that, that we have many monopolies. We have like one soup kitchen, one, uh, one big hat for all the shelters. But at the same time, we have one table of consultation, which, which was really different in other cities that, that we investigate. There is a lot of tables of consultation about homelessness. In Sherbrooke, we have the Table de l'Itinérance de Sherbrooke, with, I think, Gabriel, the coordinator is right here. <laughs> and this table was uh, mentioned in every interview that I did. The, the city is there. There is a federal representative at this table. So, and, and every communica community organizations and public sector service that works with people uh, experiencing homelessness have a place there. So this place is really, when COVID hit, it was there that things were happening. It's, it's really like, since we only have one gathering speaking about homelessness, they have subcommittees, but still it's one table, not 17. <laughs> So we're sure that everyone is there. Everyone has approximately the time to be there. And so, so this, this is for us like uh, something really positive. Um, so uh, in British Columbia, there's a, a, a provincial organization called BC Housing that uh, you certainly know about and uh, work with. And uh, uh, so uh, to a certain extent, cities in British Columbia have a certain learned helplessness because they think Oh, BC Housing will look to them to do this. I've been now saying in Nanaimo that the cavalry isn't necessarily coming uh, for all the pro problems that you're facing as a city. And uh, we need to really think about how we can marshal the resources as a community to address this. So, um, so interesting differences in each province around that. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Rafat Noor. I live in a mid-sized uh, city, Red Deer, Alberta, and I work in a municipal government. I was involved in last, uh, with the last year's speed count, so I, my question is for the last group. Um, so my question is, you mentioned that you integrated pit count um, into your service-based count. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you uh, continue that process for the subs subsequent pit count, like last year's pit count and the one that we'll have next year. Um, also, I am wondering if uh, that integration was only for enumeration component or both survey and enumeration component of speed count. And if it was for survey component, uh, were you able to reword or rephrase the reaching home provided questions? Because after the speed count, we got feedback from service providers um, because we involved service providers uh, to do the survey. So we got feedback that questions were not helpful and the um, survey was lengthy, um, so it's, uh, it, if we uh, can change the question or rephrase the question, that will be helpful because uh, their service provider, when they talk to a client or um, uh, people experiencing homelessness, 
um, and if anybody says, I am homeless, they cannot just move to the next question. They have to uh, provide the support, uh, counsel, um, so it takes time. So, uh, so I just wanted to know the, uh, about the process. There's a lot there. <laughs> Okay, so in, in our experience, what we did, and we were kind of fortunate enough to do the pick count, um, and we did them side by side in 2016, uh, the same month. So our service-based count is a, is a month long. It's, it's like a prevalence kind of, uh, uh, period prevalence kind of uh, count, and with the pick count in April. It's, they're two very vast types of, of, of uh, tools. So, um, so, so some of the questions, so there is a screening in process, but it's very detailed, but I would have to say that having both in our community has really kind of strengthened the service-based count because we were seeing the same trends, we were gathering the same kinds of information from the standardized national tool, and having a very separate estimation tool from a service provision and getting sort of the same information except larger and, and discovering the hidden homelessness within our community, which you really can't get with the pig count, and that's why we need something different for rural context. But I, I know you asked a lot of questions about the survey tool itself. It, it is different, so it, it has a different context and, and um, I don't know how to the detail, what was it, was there anything in particular you wanted to know? In the pick count? No. No. Yeah. And that's the benefit of having a nationalized, a standard nationalized tool is you have the same questions. So that when you're aggregating the data nationally, you have good data source, right? So that's kind of why they want you to ask those specific questions in the manner and the methodology that they want you to do. So that's kind of an important context to the, to the pick count and as well with other types of counts as well. Um, I think, I believe the pick count, they allow you to have four community questions at the end, if they still do. Um, and so that's where you maybe get to kind of have your own local context to what you might want to add on. Yeah, sure. Just, just to add to that a little bit, for the service-based count in our region, um, the questions were given to the sector first. Uh, does this feel good to you? Are these, is this the data you want? If this is the order we're proposing. Um, is there any feedback? They gave us feedback and we made adjustments where we're not using a national standardized tool. I know that is happening in a lot of areas and because we're not, we're getting left out of some of the larger case studies because we aren't doing that. But arguably, it's kind of a catch-22 of do we want to be captured on the national scale and get Nova Scotia and the Annapolis Valley on the map more that way or do we want the questions that match our sector and our current needs? So it's a really tricky line to walk, and I know our key informant um, in research, Mary Sweetman, is looking into that a bit more for us on where do we ask for the national scale and where do we ask for our own. And uh, in our region, there is a military base, and so we added last year a question on um, is, this, uh, are you, um, is this individual like a veteran or have they served in the RCMP, the Navy, et cetera, um, just based on our, our own context. So, and all those asset-based questions were developed by the sector and given to Mary um, in ways that they want to ask that. And from a homeless no more perspective, when we do the data and it informs policy, whenever we have a, a policy ask, we sent out, it's not very formal, just a Google form <laughs> um, to the sector of these are the policy asks, this is what we heard from you, does this still feel true? And if it doesn't, let us know, we'll adjust. That's the intent of what the data can give us, is just a state of readiness and the ability to respond when needed and when we're called on it to act or to um, support folks. We're still learning our own process, still moving through um, collective impact, but I, from our perspective, I don't think we're gonna lose the sector building the survey because that's part of our relationship building and seeing the expertise in the sector of you know you wor your work and we wanna honor that. Um, and then we can do the work on the other end to find how we get captured in the national data without asking the national standardized questions. Thank you. Just, what? 10 seconds, I, I absolutely <laughs> agree um, and my, my position, and this is one of my, I've organized three pick counts, so I have some uh, pain to share. Um, <laughs> the pit count is designed to do a certain thing, 
and it's gone away from that, and I am not a reformist either. And it needs to be, my, idea, my opinion, be tighten it up and leave it as it was originally. It's trend data. We need other types of research and data like this kind of innovation side by side with it, better by name list, better narrative research, life histories, so on and so forth. So that's my election platform. <laughs> I'm Michael Connor, I'm from the city of Grand Prairie. And we are following a model where uh, Finland has a PABO 1 and PABO 2 program. And that program has identified, they started in 2012, and they uh, brought uh, all our people together and started their lottery corporation, funding a uh, building of 40 unit places where people can go and get the, the help, deal with the trauma, give them their secure home, and we are doing a similar type thing uh, in Grand Prairie. It's uh, very expensive. Uh, it doesn't make sense for 100,000 plus per homeless, but if you don't do that, your community gets taken over, and so we need to work together to lobby the government. This is not a municipal problem. This is not a provincial problem. This is a federal problem. And they need to find the resources and put it all so all of you will have the money to be able to do your jobs. So I'm honest, and it, it's, it's been a difficult role over the last year, but we built a, or converted a old hotel. Uh, we've got 63 pods. We now have 30 people, nine of which are in programs. Two have reached sobriety, and we're identifying the people. We have mobile outreach, and the mobile outreach goes and knows every single person that's on the street. Is it easy? No, it's not, but it's working, and hopefully we'll get 63 uh, uh, housed by, by January, and by the end of the year, <clears throat> sorry, at the beginning of January, we'll have transition for them to move out of the 63 into the 43 units and then get them permanent housing because housing first is where it's at. So, thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I was just wondering if any of your research touches on what's next um, and what your experiences have been with actioning the data because in I'm from the Northwest Territories and something that we've really struggled with is getting the feds and funding partners to listen to the data because having it um, be reflective of local needs is one thing but then actually being able to do something with it is a whole other problem. So I'm wondering if you guys have touched on that in your research. Um, I love this question, thank you for that. Um, part of Homeless No More is after we do a service-based count, we do that question back, the policy ask back to our sector, and then we host, what we did was host an, an event, if you will, um, where we had federal, provincial, and the service providers in the room, and we did table placements. So if it was a provincial and federal representative from West Hans, they sat at a table with the service providers from West Hans. And we hosted like a world cafe facilitation, if you've done that, that's table style question, conversation based, and the intent was to humanize even from a government perspective of that reciprocity piece of we want to understand how to better help you. What barriers do you also have to move this work forward? That's the role of Homeless No More. We're not funded by the government. So we can ask them. We're not, we're not funded. We're not an organization. We're an initiative of partnerships, if that makes sense. Um, but we work as that third party for when our sector is funded and can't push the government because their whole funding stream is at risk when they do. Part of Homeless No More is to hear them, hear their words, take their words, and relay it back to policymakers or the government in, involved with their funding and offer support where we can. So we took the engagement approach 
We've had some government folks really buy into that, some at the MLA level who really felt, they, so one of them said to us, I came to a room and I didn't feel attacked. I felt like my experience is part of this and I felt part of this work. And that's the intent of what we're trying to do with the data and I think that's the asset of asking questions that are very contextual to our area, that the MLAs of that area can take that and move with it. Um, so I do appreciate how that's moved forward but we're learning as we go. That went well in, in May but now new things are coming up so we might have to shift how we use the data but our, we're really rooted in action research so that our, our data, this is why we haven't focused on getting in the national papers, the national reports, because we're so focused on how do we put the action into work. Um, so it's been conversational and meeting one-on-one -on -one with government folks and building that relationship so that when Homeless No More has an ask, it's, it's an ask of the sector is the intent and with the data to back it up. And I'm gonna invite the rest of the folks if anyone wants to add. So this is a really good question, particularly for Kelowna, because we um, had the Journey Home Society, which actually instituted a local homelessness plan at the municipal level. Uh, it was just announced that they are not receiving funding to continue as an organization. So the answer to how we are going to do this work and secure funding and put this data into practice, in Kelowna's context, a lot is not known. A lot is up in the air. A lot of the community initiatives, like we're talking like tables, collaborative efforts, those were hosted by Journey Home as an organization. So we don't know what's going to happen. But if anything, in Kelowna's context, a lot of emphasis by service providers was that COVID as a phenomenon proved that we can get money, we can get it quickly, and we can figure out as a community where that money should go. So there's been a lot of advocacy for we know it's there, we know how to use it. So that's what we're currently focusing on. But similarly, we just had a, a Kelowna sit-in two weekends ago where we did a lot of uh, community, community advocacy with all levels of government, service providers, people with lived experience. So we found at the community level that's a really effective way to engage all levels and voice concerns, express interests without it feeling like, you know, there's, it's us against them, so. Um, but that was amazing. Can we give a round of applause? And like also, yeah, it's so great. Such a great team.